Hello folks, Professor Fiore here, and in this video we are going to talk about diode clippers. Something like this. The basic idea behind a clipper is to limit the size of the input signal so we don't possibly damage or overload a stage in our system. Uh, this is kind of a brute force method. You're just going to say, look, if the signal gets above a certain level, we're just going to chop it off. All right. Now, in this particular example, we have a 20 volt source, 20 volt peak source sine wave. R1 serves as a current limiter, which I'll explain in a second. And then we have a pair of parallel diodes, right, in reverse connection here. So here's what happens at really small signals, maybe a few hundred millivolts. The diodes are not turned on. Remember, it takes about seven tenths of a volt to turn on silicon diodes. So these sit out here as a high resistance, essentially. And whatever we throw in is what we get out. But when the input signal goes beyond that 7 tenths, one of these diodes is going to turn on, right? So for a positive input, D1 will turn on. For a negative input, D2 will turn on. And that will limit the output swing to the forward uh, bias diode drop. The R1 value back here serves as the current limiter. So let's say the input was at 10 volts, right? You'd have 7 tenths across here. Where's the other 9.3 go? Well, if you don't have R1, then that has to be lost in the internal impedance of the generator, which is probably not a good thing, generally speaking. That's going to demand a huge amount of current from this generator. So R1 is sitting here to sort of take that potential. In this case, you know, if you had 10 volts, 7 tenths is here. You know, KVL says 9.3 across this, all right, you're going to limit that output current from the generator to 9.3 mils. All right. All right. So let's check what happens here. We'll do a, a little transient analysis and see how well this works. Okay. Let's move this over here so we can see it. And put our legend down. Okay. So the green is the generator, right? There's our 20 volt peak, 50 hertz sine wave. And the maroon is the load, which you can see is, you know, completely sort of squashed here. And what I'm going to do is just so that you can see this a little better, I'm going to zoom in on this for a verification, right? So this green going off scale is the generator and this maroon is the load voltage. So let's grab a measurement probe here. And all right, so that's coming out at just over 700 millivolts, 0.7 volts. And on the negative end, basically the same thing, right? So we're getting about 7 tenths of a volt as we expected. All right, so this is behaving, you know, as, uh, as indicated, right? Um, the question might be, you know, where am I going to use 7 tenths of a volt? Uh, that seems like a pretty small potential. Well, the classic use for this in an audio circuit would be to generate guitar fuzz, you know, a distortion box, something like that. Typically, we would have a small... Maybe uh, discrete, maybe a you know bipolar or field effect transistor stage, and we would just put these diodes across the output and they'll clip. I turn the gain up, we get a bigger signal, so there's a larger percentage of clipping. All right, and that's how we generate simple guitar fuzz. Um, we could also use an operational amplifier for this, and uh, you know turn one of the feedback resistors into a potentiometer rheostat. In which case we can control the gain that way and you know get more more or less distortion depending on the gain all right obviously you know if you think about this for just a second as far as you know safety is concerned i might want a situation with a higher voltage in other words i don't want to clip at 0.7 maybe i want to clip at 5 or 10 or 15 volts how do i do that now one possibility you know maybe the first thing in your mind is well i'll just make a string of diodes, right? You know, I'll put 10 of these diodes in series and 10 over here, seven tenths of each, you know, that'll be roughly seven volts for my clip point, all right? Well, you could do that, but it's really not the most effective, most efficient way to approach this. Um, another option is to use Zener diodes, right? So you put the Zener diodes, not in parallel, but in series back to back. So one of these is gonna be forward biased and one of these is gonna be reverse biased. So using that same input signal, right, if it's a small voltage below the Zener potential. So now I've put two different Zeners in here. So the upper Zener here, the 5227, is a 3.6 volt. 
and the lower one, the 5231, is a 5.1 volt. They could be the same value, but I purposely put two different ones in here to show you how you can do this. You can make an asymmetrical clip. In any case, so if I have a small potential volt or two, then these diodes are basically going to sit there open. And we have that same sort of situation that we had in the, in the earlier case with very, very small inputs. The output will be whatever the input is, right? So I got two volts coming in. Okay, the output's two volts. No sweat. Now, when the signal gets big enough, right, in this case, when we get up to, you know, let's say four volts, five volts, something in that region, positive, Z1 is going to turn on. And that will produce a 0.7 volt drop plus to minus, right, top to bottom. Z2, if that signal is big enough, will go into Zener conduction. And that is going to lock, the 5231 is going to lock at 5.1 volts. So you're going to have 5.1 volts plus to minus top to bottom on Z2, and you're going to have another 0.7 plus to minus top to bottom on Z1. So that's 5.8 volts. That's going to be the limit on this. Right? So for a positive input, we would expect to see a limit of roughly 5.8 volts. Um, on the other swing, right, when I have a negative input, you know, you think of the current going this way, Z2 is going to be forward biased. So that's going to have 0.7. And if it's big enough, if the signal is big enough, 5227Z1 goes into Zener conduction at 3.6 volts. So we're going to have 3.6 plus 0.7 from Z2, and that's going to be sitting at 4.3 volts. So I'm going to have a 4.3 volt clip on that end. All right, let's verify that with a transient analysis. Bading. Okay, so once again... Green is the generator and maroon is the load. So we'll put a little probe on here. And right in the middle, look at that. We're getting 5.7, almost 5.8, which is, you know, right what we were expecting. And then when we go to the other end, we go to the negative end, right? So at the negative end, right, current's coming up like this. Z1 is the uh, device in Zener conduction. So we get 3.6 plus 0.7 or about 4.3, and that's right where we are on that, okay? Looking good so far. Notice how this is not perfectly flat, right? There is a little bit of a bend there, but it's pretty darn good for the most part, all right? Because the impedance on this is not like a switch. It just doesn't go from high to low instantaneously. You know, when you're in an in-between voltage, when you're approaching the knee of that curve, right, that shows up as this little bit of a bend, down here. All right. Okay, beauty. Now, is there a problem with this? A limitation with this version? Well, yeah, there's actually two limitations with this, and that is what values of Zener can you get? In other words, you're limited by standard values here. Just like resistors, you know, there are standard values for resistors, there are standard values for Zeners. So, what if I want 3.75 volts? You know, can I find something close? Well, the next standard up from this is 3.9. So ugh, you got that little bit, little bit of a problem. The other thing is if you want to change this programmatically, in other words, like while the circuit is running, maybe a special application, but you might want to do something like that. Um, you don't have any way of doing that. You don't have any way of swapping out or changing the Zener potential while the circuit's operating. You'd have to maybe somehow swap out the, the Zener's you know, with some kind of switch or plug-in or something like that, right? You turn it off, change the zeners. Um, but programmatically, no, you can't really do that, right? In other words, it's not like a dynamic thing that you can adjust. Well, is there a way to do that? Yes, there is, right? We can solve both problems with this circuit. This is a biased diode. So this is just like the first circuit, right? So I'll go back to that real quick, like, so here's our first circuit, and our modified circuit just throws in a couple of power supplies. And essentially what this does is these power supplies sort of hold off the turn-on for these two diodes. So let's look at the positive input first. All right. Before, with this diode being connected to ground, it only took 7 tenths of a volt to turn it on. Now, however, we have a 10-volt power supply sitting over here. So what ends up happening is this end of the diode, in other words, V-load, has to get up to 10.7 in order to turn D1 on. 
So when D1 turns on, this is a uh, you know, small impedance. And of course, when we do an analysis on here, the internal resistance of the DC source is also very, very small, right? Ideally, it's zero. So that, again, sort of limits what that voltage can be, in this case, 10.1. On this end, it's a similar sort of situation, except, you know, we've not only have we flipped the diode, we've also flipped the polarity of the power supply. But it's the same idea. I need to sort of bias this to, to hold off that, uh, turn on voltage. So in this case, I've got five volts. It's going to take a negative 5.7 to turn the diode on, right? To turn D2 on, because here's ground. This end is at minus five. This end has to be 0.7 below. So that's negative 5.7. So that's where I expect my clipping points to be with this circuit. Let's do a transient analysis on this and see what we get. Okie dokie. Oh, same colors. And we'll put a probe out here. And all right, we were expecting 10.7 for there, and there it is, right on the money, 10.7. And we come down here, and we we're expecting 5.7. And again, there we are, negative 5.7. And we can tweak this, right? If I want to put in 10.2 uh, volts or, you know, 4.79 volts, I can do that. And all right, the next cool thing, so I, I have this flexibility now that I didn't have before, but I can also do this programmatically. In other words, I could have this, instead of being a power supply, you know, like you would use in lab, this could be the output of some circuit that has an adjustable voltage, right? You know, like, you know, there could be like a direct coupled amplifier kind of thing or a little linear regulator um, that we could hook up to here and adjust that voltage, and therefore we can adjust the clip points on here, right? Okay, beauty. So this is probably your most flexible version, but you know, if you can find standard Zeners, this is a nice simple way of doing it, right? It's a minimum component kind of way of doing it. So either one of these of these two versions can work really well. And of course, if you just need 0.7, well, you can use the first the first circuit. You don't need the uh, you don't need the power supplies in here, right? The the DC voltage sources. So again, the clipper can be used to protect the following stage to make sure that the voltage coming into that stage isn't so high it causes damage or some other kind of problem, right? The diodes are going to be in reverse connection. And don't forget that we have to have something out here to do current limiting. You don't want to place this directly across your generator. All right. OK, so any questions, put them down in the comments like usual. And... I'll see you next time.